It happens every weekday morning between the hours of 6.30 and 8.30 in hundreds of thousands of homes all over the country. The last cup of coffee, the snatched briefcase or lunch pail, the short walk to the garage, and the twist of the wrist that brings the reliable engine of the family car to life. There's really nothing quite like a car for getting to work. It's ready when you are. It's handy, comfortable, safe, and warm. You can listen to the radio, sing songs, or talk to yourself. The automobile is the ultimate in personal transportation. There's nothing like it. Except sometimes. Like when a few hundred thousand other commuters have to be at work the same time you do. Then the zest for song gives way to another mood, best not discussed. And it happens just this way, Monday through Friday, for people from coast to coast. When your speedometer touches zero, all the advantages of personal transportation evaporate, except one. You can still talk to yourself. But the engineering sciences have a solution. It's called rapid transit, and it's a developing reality for the San Francisco Bay Area. This is its story, the story of an engineering masterpiece and of the intricate, comprehensive, and very necessary scientific testing that is going into its development. It is the story of how a few hundred thousand weekday commuters are on the threshold of solving their transportation problems the easy way by sharing the advantages of transport for tomorrow. The concept of getting people from suburbs to city the most comfortably, safely, speedily, and excitingly has intrigued both engineers and artists for years. The Sunday supplement has been a favorite place for the creative artist to express himself and his imagination has touched almost every conceivable and inconceivable scheme for hurling commuters through the air, on the surface, or under the ground. For Californians, where the car is the indispensable tool for everyday life, the idea is not only appealing, it is increasingly imperative because every single day of the year, more than 1,000 new commute cars are added to the state's network of freeways and there's no end in sight. But in the San Francisco Bay Area, engineers are in the process of constructing a bold and imaginative solution, the most modern and advanced rapid transit system in the world. Before it is completed, it will involve the construction of subways, tunnels, aerial structures, surface rail lines, and massive passenger stations. Before it is completed, it will use more steel than went into both the Golden Gate and the Bay Bridges combined. It is one of the largest single projects ever carried out in the United States, and it will cost $1 billion. Manager of engineering at the Bay Area Rapid Transit District is Mr. Les Irvin, who has worked on a great many big projects before. But this one is the biggest, and in many ways, the most exciting. From an engineering standpoint, this project is immensely appealing. There are thousands of problems to be solved, many of them unique, some never before attempted. But chiefly, this project is appealing because there are so few restraints, no preconceptions of how things must be done. Originality and imagination are prime necessities for the engineer on this project. When you start from scratch on any project, you have to have a clear idea of just what it is you're trying to do and a clear plan of how to do it. The fundamental challenge faced by Les Irvin and his engineering colleagues on this project was to provide a system so attractive, so safe, dependable, and rapid that it would lure commuters out of their cars and off the crowded freeways. What kind of a scheme is this anyway, Chuck? Well, this man proposes to store potential energy in this huge wind-up spring. You wound up as it goes downhill in order to propel it as it goes up succeeding hills and along the track. That's about the same scheme as my kids have their electric train or their wind-up trains, isn't it? That's right, and if you expanded the scale of that uh, 
coil, we'd probably require tunnels uh, twice the diameter that we have now. I wonder if he's considered... What in the course of preliminary study, which included all forms of mass transportation, a great many people came forward with some fairly outlandish solutions to the traffic problem. But even ideas like this one were given an honest evaluation. You know, this does seem like one of these impractical schemes, though, that has some practical value for a system, but when you consider all overall reliability, it just won't work. For very special applications only, for a very flexible system, which is required for a large, complex system as we have here, it would certainly never work out. Basic to all the construction plans were certain criteria, fundamental characteristics that a modern rapid transit system must have. First of all, it had to be fast. Although, curiously enough, speed itself was less important than its ability to make frequent stops at station platforms. Even so, the system's equipment should be capable of speeds up to 70 miles an hour, so that its average speed, including stops, would be near 50 miles an hour. High speeds plus frequent stops and starts mean uh, rates of acceleration and uh, braking capability requiring very careful control. Uh, it's difficult to do this manually, and therefore automatic controls using electronic components are, are the obvious solution. I believe most of us have, have been on buses and streetcars where the stop and starting uh, has caused jerks and, and discomfort, and uh, we are looking for a smooth ride to harmonize, you might say, with the aesthetically pleasing surroundings which the passenger will be in during his uh, riding on the transit system. The decision to use some kind of train was reached early in the planning stages. But then the important decision of what kind of train. Should it be supported from below or suspended from above? The mono or one rail concept has long captured the imagination of both public and transportation engineers. And it was given exhaustive evaluation. But in the opinion of Les Irvin and other engineers, its limitations outweighed its advantages for their system, which would be the fastest in the world and which would involve switching from track to track as well as traveling on a straight, continuous system. At length, after all manner of tests, including wind tunnel evaluations, it was decided to use a supported system riding on dual rails spaced one foot farther apart than standard gauge. The final decisions resulted in a handsome train like this. Before such a train could be put into service, literally thousands of separate tests had to be conducted. Tests which involved every aspect of the engineering sciences. That meant constructing test track and test cars to carry special equipment. The only passengers these test cars will ever carry are engineers and electronic specialists who are measuring the performance of propulsion systems, automatic train control systems, braking devices, suspension systems, power transmission systems, and many different types of wheels and rail fastening devices. In a project like this, which begins with no preconceptions, each decision opens the door to new questions which uh, require new decisions. Once certain fundamental decisions had been made, such as the fact that we have arrived at a uh, supported dual rail system, construction can be started and additional tests carried out. In order to provide test vehicles on which various systems can be mounted for study, three cars like these were built, A, B, and C, for Agnes, Betsy, and Claire. These cars travel back and forth as many as 20 times daily here at the test track in suburban Concord. Testing goes on around the clock because deadlines for beginning service are uncomfortably close. Question, what kind of motive power shall the rapid transit train have? And how shall it be expressed? Through motors mounted on the wheel trucks or inside the cars? We are using electric power because our studies indicate it's economic for the uh, Bay Area and also it's a quiet system. 
We're testing five different types of uh, motors and drives. Some of these are mounted directly on the axle. Some of them are connected through a differential. And other motors are mounted on the body of the car and transmitted through a drive shaft to the trucks. Question, shall the power be AC or DC? This is one of the answers we're looking for on the test track. Actually, the track is electrified with both AC and DC power. And we will be testing both types of motors on the, uh, uh, during our testing program. And it's one of the answers that we're looking for. Question, how shall the power be transmitted to the cars? By overhead line, third rail, or something else? At the very beginning, uh, we considered uh, a number of different systems. Obviously, the catenary system, which is the overhead line, uh, seemed to be the most obvious, but uh, this has become a very unsightly system, and we certainly wish to avoid it. Really, the determining factor was the use of power in subways, where the overhead lines would uh, require additional clearance and larger subways. So actually, it's more economic to use the uh, track side third rail, and on the other hand, it's also a, a more aesthetically pleasing system. Mel, how's the uh, automatic train control working out on car B? Questions and more questions. There seems to be no end to them. But that's the challenge and excitement of this kind of brand new task. The engineer, like all scientists, is curious to know the answers. And he's intellectually restless until he finds them. We've added more resistance and an additional contact, electrical contactor. Uh, so far, it's working real well. We have great hopes that it'll be very smooth. We uh, are, are, are certainly conscious of a smooth stop because we we promised the passengers a, a smooth ride and smooth acceleration and deceleration is a is of prime importance. I think we can achieve it this way with this particular system. Right. Agnes and Betsy and Claire were built for the single purpose of evaluating the many systems that may be included in the final design decisions. And so, each car is equipped with such devices as this waveguide antenna, which tells electronic engineers in a central control room exactly where the car is at any given time. Track receivers like this one, and this one, supply similar information. It is important to know exactly how fast the cars are traveling at any given moment, and so they're equipped with various speed measuring devices, and distance measuring devices, and braking devices. And every day the cars leave the shop for runs on the track so that even more tests can be made. Inside, the engineer passengers test and measure hundreds of separate items, such as acceleration, deceleration, braking, smoothness of ride, precision of automatic control, power consumption at various speeds, noise level, sway factors, and many other things. And all of the information is recorded and stored for future evaluation. The decision to use wider tracks was at the time considered to be a, a little bit bizarre. But as we got farther into the testing program, we realized that it was necessary to provide wider tracks based upon wind tunnel tests which were made on the models of the cars. And these indicated that a wider gauge was necessary to uh, obtain the safety against overturning and uh, for the prevailing winds and the long uh, uh, sections of overhead uh, line which occur in the Bay Area. But that wasn't the end of the decisions on trackage by any means. Tests are going on every day at the Concord facility to evaluate things like the kind of ties to be used and the kind of rails. There's no point in imitating standard rail design when you have a free hand to design something better. The something better for the Bay Area rapid transit system had to achieve a maximum degree of smoothness and quietness along with safety. And so manufacturers from all over the United States and the world have submitted different designs for the way in which the continuously welded steel rails may be mounted and secured. Rubber dampeners and rubber foundations are common. Actually, anything that makes noise is being given microscopic attention because noise annoys passengers. 
This system has to compete with a private automobile for the use of commuters. Nobody here ever forgets that. As an example, uh, we are presently testing some uh, uh, eight different types of track fasteners. And these are being tested to minimize the noise generated by the track. At the same time, we're also running tests on uh, acoustically designed wheels, rubber air springs, resilient chassis, and uh, various other types of mountings involving the use of rubber to reduce noise. The performance of Agnes, Betsy, and Claire is constantly monitored from this room located in the engineering building. It is never enough in a scientific study like this to offer subjective judgments of good or bad. You have to have descriptive data, facts and figures. And here on these graphs, measurements are precisely made. What is Betsy's vibration factor? How stable is Agnes? How accurately did Claire stop at the loading gate? There isn't any guessing out here at Concord. The facts show up here. S9 to car Charlie. Go ahead, S9. Uh, what is full, uh, what is straight air pipe pressure right now? 71.5 PSI. While Agnes, Betsy, and Claire are sweeping around the test track, other studies are going on to provide information about the passengers who will use the rapid transit system. How many will there be? Where will they come from? Where will they want to go? How will they get to the stations? Will they drive and park? Or will they be what rapid transit engineers call kiss riders, those commuters whose wives drop them off at suburban stations? When you're dealing with a $1 billion project, you have to know all the answers, including how to sell tickets. And so all manner of design types were constructed in various sizes in order to test for function and for appearance. Plans call for the use of a special magnetized ticket, which can be coded with necessary information concerning individual passenger trips. The system is planned to be the most modern in the world and it will certainly incorporate special computers to tabulate and record passenger fares. The whole transaction will be performed by these handsome flush-mounted vending machines. Beauty and aesthetics have played a large part in all the planning. As the engineers say, you don't just want to get them there, you want to get them there happy. And so a lot of thought has gone into making the passengers comfortable with custom seating, and keeping them happy with smooth rides and aesthetically pleasing surroundings. A lot of thought has gone into what the stations will look like, too. From stations such as these, rapid transit commuters will board trains which will arrive every 90 seconds during rush hours, and which will sweep to a stop within inches of wind and noise-proof doors leading directly into the cars. Cars which were designed to offer commuters a vehicle that is faster safer, more comfortable, and more convenient than driving a private automobile on Bay Area streets and highways. And this is the scale model's full-size counterpart, designed to please people of all sizes, shapes, ages, attitudes, and walks of life. It was begun with no preconceived notions of what it should look like, only what it should accomplish. Speed, safety, comfort, smoothness, and quietness of ride, frequency and dependability of service, economy, convenience, and aesthetics. In the control cab, or pod as it is called, there's a console for the engineer or train controller, but his function will be limited to slowing the train or stopping it. Aside from that, he can talk to the passengers on special microphone circuits, supervise the opening and closing of the doors under certain circumstances, and occasionally adjust the air conditioning, which in the Bay Area can change as much as 30 degrees within the space of a few miles. Aside from that, he's just along for the ride, because the entire handling or controlling of the trains will be done by computers. At a remote console in the main control building to be located in downtown Oakland, a supervising operator will watch over the electronic devices that will dispatch the trains, monitor their speeds, and control their separation. The whole thing is to be automated and foolproof. 
As an example, if train number 100 lags a shade too far behind train number 101, the computer will automatically tell it to speed up. And this computer system will sweep the trains to a stop within inches of a given spot on the station platform, something no human engineer could consistently do. The route that the trains will travel covers 75 miles of surface, aerial, and subway tracks between San Francisco, Oakland, Fremont, Concord, and Richmond. 24 miles of the wide gauge clickless steel rails will be on the surface. 31 miles will be supported overhead on aerial pylons like these. And 17 miles will be underground in subways or underwater in one of the world's most ambitious engineering projects, the Trans Bay Tube, which will connect downtown Oakland with downtown San Francisco. So, that's it. The rapid transit system that Bay Area commuters will be riding before long. It isn't ready to go into service yet, but we'll try to picture what it will be like. checking in at the commute station nearest your home and using your magnetized commute card to secure admission to the station platform. The computer at the control center has its electronic eye on what your train is doing and precisely on schedule it will sweep silently into the station, pause, and let you in. After that, you're in for the smoothest, quickest, quietest, safest ride you ever took to work or anywhere else. It isn't ready yet, but the project is well underway. And it won't be too long before Agnes, Betsy, and Claire will have completed their work and taken a siding for their sleepy streamlined successors. Meanwhile, commuters in the Bay Area may continue to drive to work if they wish, but while they're creeping along, they can dream a little of the day in the not-too-distant future when their area will have the world's most modern transportation system. As a commuter himself, Les Irvin is doing everything he can to bring that day about just as soon as possible. That's part of his job as an engineer and as a scientist in action.